bumper harvest spread out in the October sunshine. In the fall, the Conception Bay Highway from Bay Roberts to Carbonear becomes an open-air market. Local farmers selling fresh vegetables from roadside stands. And business is pretty well non-stop. All of these farmers come from Shearstown, near Bay Roberts. The largest of them is Hodge Acres Farms, owned by the Sparks family. This stand is being run by Terry Sparks, the youngest of three Sparks brothers, who've taken over the farm from their father. This is their payoff for months of hard work, of breaking ground, planting, tending, and finally, harvesting. Tonight, we'll follow the Sparks farm for the 1983 growing season. Late spring, icebergs still linger in the bay. In the rich brown soil of Shearstown, another patch of white, shimmering in the clear sunlight. The white patch is actually thousands of heads of cabbage, protected by miniature paper greenhouses called hot caps. This will be the first crop for the year, the early crop for Hodge Acres Farm. Gary Sparks is the eldest of the Sparks brothers. He became the unofficial manager of the whole operation when his father retired. Gary explained to me how getting a good crop of early cabbage provides a fine head start on the year. Well, we planted these about three weeks ago. Uh, the frost was a bit heavy. Uh, this this uh, hot cap will protect the uh, plant from the frost and rain, wind, whatever, and it enables us to uh, plant that much earlier. Also, uh, the plant, right now we opened these this morning, some of these this morning, the plant is uh, that much more developed, eh? Uh, we've got some down the other end of the field that we planted the same day, and the plants aren't uh, quite as big as these, hey? These, are, but uh, we opened these this morning. Uh, we didn't take the cap right off, because we had to let them harden off because uh, they've been in the same kind of a situation here under the cap as if they were in a greenhouse. And they have to uh, harden off before we expose them uh, to the whatever frost we may get now, or wind or rain, whatever. So we let them harden off now for a few days and then we'll take the cap right off them all together. But with the early, earlier crop, you get the premium prices. This is uh, the reason we can uh, use the hot caps. Uh, we wouldn't be able to use them on a mid-season cabbage because the price is not, this, you know, the price is not there. But we can use them on the earlier crop, and uh, we'll pretty well be the first in the market with early cabbage in this area. So, how much earlier can you have your uh, crop on the market than uh, people who don't use them? Oh, probably two or three weeks. Is that a big advantage? That's a big advantage. We can get the price. We can uh, get a better price for them within that two or three weeks, and we can pretty well clean up this uh, ten thousand right here. How does this operation compare now with? most farms in, in this particular area? In size? Yeah. In size, uh, we plant about 40 acres, and uh, we employ about oh, probably 20 people from the beginning of the season to the end. And they're not on full time, most of those are on part time, but uh, most of them will get anywhere from 10 to 15 weeks. Has Sherristown always been the big farming area? I would say uh, farming in Sherristown has probably been the major industry in Shearstown for as long as I can ever remember. Mostly vegetable farms or with uh, other types? There were, a lot, there were a lot of sheep farmers here in the area at one time, but uh, all the sheep farmers are gone out of business. So more or less vegetables, keeping everybody going. Yeah, dogs don't affect the vegetables. <laughs> of the 40 acres the Sparks plant, only a few are located in Shearstown. Land is very limited there, so the farm has expanded to new areas like here on Roach's Line. They rented this land for the first time this year and will use it to grow their second crop of cabbage. We expand because of uh, our land base. We need to clean so we need to clean areas and clean soil, so that's why we, we rented the land more or less so we could uh, 
have the land to plant uh, cabbage or turnip. Is it hard expanding a farm like this, this day and age? Uh, it all depends on what you mean by hard. It, it's uh, not too difficult to rent land if uh, you want to pay the price. There's quite a bit of land on Roach's line that we could rent if you want to, depending on how big you want to go. How many acres have you got here on, on Roach's line? Uh, right here we've got about uh, nine to ten acres. Now, how many plants are you putting in here today? Uh, we'll probably put in about 15,000. 15,000 cabbage plants. Is that going to be for the whole area? you got more to put in. Oh, no, that's just today. Uh, in this old area, the area right here, we'll probably put in, oh, probably 120,000. That'll be cauliflower plants and all. 120,000 plants? Yeah. So now, you say this is your second crop. What does that mean? This would be the mid-season crop right here. Uh, this, is a, this is a crop that we hope to be ready uh, probably the first week, couple of weeks in September. The earlier crop will uh, be ready uh, the middle of July. Well, that's down home. But this is uh, the mid-season crop here uh, that we're planting right now. But uh, later crop, we've got about 15,000 more of these uh, mid-season cabbage to go in. And then we'll start on the uh, later crop, the late uh, storage variety cabbage. You got uh, how many people do you have working with you at, at a time like this when you're putting in a new crop like this? Oh, we've got uh, seven or eight fellows here today. Uh, we won't go any more than that, not uh, when we're planting. Uh, when we harvest and uh, when we weed, when we do the weeding, we probably have on a crew of uh, sometimes 15 to 20. It was a good day for planting, but it had been a cold, wet spring. I asked Gary if more weather like that would hurt these plants. At this time of the year now, uh, it's not too bad. These plants are pretty well hardened off. Uh, they came out of the greenhouse into uh, a coal shed for uh, a period of a couple of weeks. And then they've been out in the open uh, now for about uh, a week and a half. So they're pretty well hardened off. They can take the frost right now. They won't, they won't take any setback, not uh, as far as frost is concerned not right now. And how's the soil here? Is it is it good, bad, there's rocky? A, there's good soil here. Uh, it's not too rocky, not uh, for the Avalon. Uh, we've picked a few rocks off it. We had the dump truck uh, up a couple of days with the tractor, and uh, we picked a few off, but not too many. Uh, we're in hopes to use this again next year. Uh, we'll have It'll be broke down uh, a lot better than this now for next year, because all this will be rotting, and all this will go to soil, and uh, it should be pretty good for next year. Shearstown and Roach's line make up less than half of Hodge Acres farms. The main farm is on the Trans-Canada Highway, just east of Whitburn. It's a familiar sight to most highway travelers. It's late July now, and the crops are well along. Turnips, carrots, beets, and potatoes. This is tending time, weeding and spraying. That's the job of the third Sparks brother, Doug. Depending on the weather, you get a lot of damp weather and uh, and muggy weather like is, is real ideal conditions for blight, right, fungus. So uh, depending on the weather, you can spray it three to four times probably in the season. That's for blight and uh, insects. Uh, again, depending on the weather and everything, uh, you get a lot of rain washed insecticide off, right? So, I mean, you get to spray probably the next week after again. Is it an expensive uh, business, uh, buying chemical sprays? And uh, yeah, so it's expensive when you look at uh, look at the cost of uh, the chemicals, all right, but it's not expensive when you look at the job it can do, right? It can save you a lot of money, and uh, if you don't use it, it can uh, you can lose a lot of money. You lose your crop. <laughs> Do you find uh, weeds present much of a problem? Uh, the weeds, are, they can be a problem, and uh, if you can get the weeds in time, uh, usually uh, we got a, they got a, a new herbicide now. We spray before uh, before the seeds come up. You spray and you kill a lot of weeds like that. But we we uh, did that this year and uh, found a really effective process uh, way ahead on the on the weeding. And, but if, if the weeds get out of control, they can, uh, they can do you a lot of damage and cost you a lot of money. 
you don't get them in time. So how many times do you weed? Uh, usually weeding is uh, usually once, probably twice uh, sometimes if you get a lot of wet weather and you get the weeds taking root back in again, like you have probably have to go through it a second time. Usually once, most of us do the job. But weeds, bugs and blight aren't the only threat to these crops. This is a prime spot for moose. Moose with a weakness for fresh cabbage. How much damage can a moose do to a, a field of cabbage? Uh, but a moose, a moose can clean up a spot of cabbage at 10 or 10,000 heads if you let them, let them stay there and feed on it, right? But uh, a moose feeding is, uh, is traveling all the time, right? So a moose can cross over a, a spot of cabbage with 20,000 heads just one crossing in about 10 minutes, and he can spoil 100 eggs of cabbage in 10, 15 minutes. He doesn't need them all, he just trods on no, them he, No, he just, he takes one bite, uh, just nips the head, the heart, you know, and he just move on, he'll graze mm -hmm. along. He'd probably trim over 100 heads going across the field. Like, you know, that's in one, one crossing, you say. So is the biggest problem here in the, the roaches, or the, here in the trans the Highway section of the farm? Oh, yes, this is the biggest problem, the main problem is here, yeah. How much, how much damage would you say you've had now from, from moose? Oh, we've had moose, moose problem over the past 10 years or so, and I'd say we've, we're over $30,000 in damages. No problem with $30,000. So how do, you, uh, how do you fight it? Well, well first we, uh, we couldn't get any, uh, we couldn't do anything about it first, we, only whatever we want to do on our own, but after a while uh, we got permission uh, from the wildlife uh, to shoot them. We got a permit to shoot and leave them on the premises. Like, so you, you shoot them, but you don't keep them? No, no, we shoot them and the wildlife come pick them up. Like, yeah, we just, just, the satisfaction we got is just to shoot them and get them out of our hands. Like, they take them away. How many have you shot? Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know how many I've shot, but I've shot, over the past 10 years, I suppose I've shot 20 or more. So I guess that, that must be probably your biggest problem, isn't it? That is the biggest problem in this area. We, uh, as a matter of fact, we had to move out of this area uh, this year, all together, we are on our roaches line now, trying to get away from it. You moved your you moved your cabbages away from here. Every all cabbages and cauliflower is uh, on roaches line this year. Mid October, that field of carrots we saw being weeded a little earlier is now ready for the harvest. Carrots are full and heavy, a good yield, the best in years. It's been a nearly perfect growing season, and the markets look good. That's a combination Gary Sparks likes. This year was pretty good, crop-wise. We've, we've had uh, pretty good yields. Uh, this is one of the better years. Last year wasn't that hot. The past couple of years hasn't been, haven't been that great. This year has been pretty good crop wise, and even the prices stayed up pretty reasonable. What made it a good year? The weather, and there wasn't there wasn't that uh, big of an abundance of crop on the market at one time. Over in the beet field, it's the same story: a bumper crop. After a number of years of poor growing weather, conditions this year were almost ideal. What kind of a, what kind of weather does it take, you know, to get a, a bumper crop such as you had this year? Oh, you want you want uh, lots of sunshine and uh, drop of rain. This has been the first year, or for probably seven or eight years, that we that, that at some time in the summer we didn't have to set up an irrigation system. We've had a reasonable amount of rain, and we've had a reasonable amount of uh, sun also. So, you had a good amount of rain. Yeah. So what was a, a bad summer for, for a lot of people uh, who took their holidays it was a good summer for you folks. That's right. That's right. Last summer was pretty hot. It was hot all summer. We had to set up the irrigation systems, and it wasn't really that good for us, right? If one crop led the way in this season of plenty, it was potatoes. This was one of the best years for potatoes in recent memory. It was even better for the Sparks because they grow the top quality blue potatoes. 
we grow blues was uh, the price. Well, we, a lot of people are growing white potatoes, and uh, this time of the year, a lot of people are into uh, the gem potatoes. And uh, the blue potato is something that we find is pretty well marketable all year round, and that's why we tend to grow the blues. You had a really good year, judging by the, the potatoes that were being dug in the field. Yeah, we had a pretty good year on the blues. We had a yield of uh, close to 15,000 pounds to the acre. 15,000 pounds to an acre? Yeah. As opposed to what's your usual, what's a good yield normally, average? I suppose a good yield would be about 12,000 pounds. 12, five, something like that. Is there such a thing as having too many potatoes? Uh, potatoes is a good storage crop. I wouldn't say there's, there's such a thing as having too many. Uh, with our market, we can, we can move a fair amount of potatoes. Not, so, not as many white ones now as blues, but uh, we can move a lot of potatoes. What about your other crops? How did you make out with uh, all of those? Oh, we had good crop all over. Good crop uh, all around. We had good crop of carrot, parsley, beets, an exceptional crop of beets. Cauliflower was pretty good. Turnips were half decent. When you've got a bumper crop on your hands, you start to worry about markets. In the past, prices have collapsed when cheaper vegetables came into the province from the mainland. A provincial commodity board is in the works to prevent that by setting minimum prices. It's a step Gary welcomes. All the years, uh, farmers could, uh, when they plant in the spring, they didn't know if they were going to get $5 a bag for, for their crop or 6 or 7 or 8 or what. So it was a job to uh, set up your financing because of this, right? So if you know, if you know at the beginning of the season that you're, not, that you're going to get X number of dollars, so you can judge your expenses according to that and work that into it. But like, like, anything like last year, you didn't know if you were going to get uh, $6 a bag or $5 a bag, or you didn't know where the price was going to go. Well, this has been the way it's been ever since I've been farming. Knowing these prices in advance, does that affect the amount of each crop that you plant? Yes, it, it doesn't have to affect the amount of crop. There's no good uh, for the farmers to, to uh, overproduce. But uh, if the market can only take uh, 10,000 sacks of cabbage per figure you know, and a certain amount of time, well, there's not much point in producing 20,000 sacks and expect to get the same price. Because you're only going to, you know, it's only a losing proposition. While the men get the vegetables ready for market, the Sparks women are busy too. Their specialty? Homemade pickles. Gary's mother, Jean, and his wife, Helen, spend many an afternoon in the kitchen, cooking up exotic combinations of vegetables, sauces, and spices. They keep their recipes a secret. It's a thriving little sideline to the family farm, bottling and labeling the pickles under their own brand name, selling them alongside the turnips, the carrots, and the cabbages at the roadside stands. And they sell very well, as many as 5,000 jars in one fall. Early Saturday morning, the trucks head out from Shearstown. This is the Thanksgiving weekend, so business should be brisk. Selling fresh vegetables at the roadside from the back of a truck is fairly new to this area. Our main marketing, marketing is done uh, from the roadside. We set up, uh, we've got four roadside stands. What's the best time of year for you fellas in terms of your biggest sales at the roadside? August would be about the biggest, July and August. That's when everything comes on stream. And you get the people traveling, so you get the, all the passing trade. This roadside marketing system, has it? Has this always been the way that uh, farmers in this area have sold their vegetables? Uh, this has only been the way now for probably five or six years. How did you uh, market your vegetables before that? Mainly in the wholesale. And uh, we travel from door to door. You load a truck in the mornings and you go all day. You set up your run on the part of Trinity Shore and, or on the North Shore. And you go each week. You pick a day in each area. And that's the way we used to sell. 
And for the wholesalers That's locally? That's your wholesale, wholesalers locally, yeah. Yeah. So what made you decide to change your mind? Were you burned up too much gas and run up and down the shore? Well, the gas, gas uh, would be part of it. And then uh, you had a lot of people dropping in here at the farm. And, uh, well, we just, it was just an idea, you know. We just set up on the road and just something that we tried and worked out. And we've been using that now for the past, like I say, six or seven years. Once the colorful displays are laid out, the roadside stands aren't long drawing customers. Terry Sparks looks after this spot and keeps track of how the other stands are doing. Seems to be pretty busy, this, uh, this roadside uh, vegetable selling. Oh yes, it's pretty good business. Like, you know, it's mostly a weekend business though. First part of the week is a bit slow, but picks up on the weekend, makes it worthwhile. How much, how much vegetables can you jam in that truck now and then get down here and sell in one of a day? Uh, quite a few in there, like, you know, it's really a job to say how many you get in there. So would you sell a truck load, for instance, in, a, in one of a day? Oh, yes, yeah. No, you know, on a Saturday, Friday or Saturday is pretty good, like, you know. And uh, like this morning now, I really didn't have enough room. I got the bunch of stuff there for the churches for Harvest Festival, and I didn't have enough room to take everything I'd like to have this morning. I'm starting to run short there now on a few things, and well, the boys will have to bring it down, you know, later on this afternoon. So it seems to me like it's, it's almost non-stop as soon as you got here, people were coming. Oh, yeah. I never had a chance to set up a display this morning. Uh, as soon as I opened the doors, they were pulling in. I could, didn't even have a chance to get the table out. I'm um, serving customers right away. How do, you, uh, how do your prices compare now with uh, supermarkets and the other retail stores around this area? Well, we, we try to be competitive, like, you know, was, I suppose bigger supermarkets, we probably are a little bit cheaper on most things, like, you know, we've got the local product and that. You get some stores now that, you know, they got imported vegetables and sometimes they are a little bit cheaper. But, you know, quality, you got to pay for it. It's been an excellent year. Fine weather, a rich crop, and now, good markets. But back in the spring, nothing is certain. When you've got $150,000 tied up in equipment, fertilizer, fuel, labor, you name it, you're gambling big on the weather, those tiny plants, and of course, the soil itself. You had to have a love for it. You have to look for the soil and the outdoors. A lot of people wouldn't get anything out of it because uh, it's too demanding. Too demanding on time. It's too demanding uh, salary-wise. You know, there's certain times in the year when you probably don't get anything. You have to wait. You have to wait till the crop is ready. And uh, what you get out of it depends on the price of the market and the price you get in the market. And uh, initially, just the overall cost of the operation. Of course, uh, sometimes even at the end of the year, you don't get that much out of it if you have a bad summer. That's right. You can have a bad summer and end up uh, with nothing, just enough to cover your expenses. So it sounds like a, pretty much of a gamble and, and a frustrating life. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like I said, you have, you've, got to, uh, you've got to acquire a taste for it. And uh, you've got to be willing to uh, take the chances.